Hey, how you doing? This is Kitch, and you are watching me play a Factorio. In the last episode, we did a basic circuit network review, as well as looked at some combinators and some of the things you can do with those, some of the operations available. And I wrapped up the episode by saying, despite all of the options and features and things you can do with combinators, primarily what I do with them are these three operations right here. And they're all very, very simple. Uh, if we look at the decider combinator for each signal coming in, greater than zero, if there is a signal, in other words, go ahead and output one of it. All right, pretty straightforward. And then we have an arithmetic combinator down here that's taking each signal coming in and adding zero to it and then outputting it. So whatever you give me, send it out. Pretty, pretty simple there. And this one right here that's saying for each signal coming in, I want you to multiply it by a negative one and then output it. By far the most complex operation uh, that we're, we're doing here. And uh, that's just taking a signal and turning it negative. Now, a lot of these, just by looking at them, don't really have a lot of value. But thanks to some of the quirks and properties that these combinators have, they actually end up being very useful. So uh, let's go ahead. We will roll the intro, and then we will get into some designs that take advantage of these operations, as well as some of these combinator quirks. a signal, adding nothing to it, and outputting that signal isn't really giving us a lot of utility mathematically. However, what it is doing is it's allowing us to take advantage of some of the little quirks and properties that these combinators have without modifying any of the values that are currently out on our network. Uh, so let's take a look at an example here of one of those properties. Uh, we're looking at two networks that are almost identical. Uh, the only difference is we have a combinator set up with the each uh, plus zero output each operator set down here. Uh, we have two boxes on the bottom. Each one of these has 100 fish, so 100 fish, 100 fish. And then we have a box up here with 100 wood. We have the exact same setup down here below. And when we come over here to this power pole and read our network values, we're getting a signal of 200 fish and 100 wood, which is what we expect. If it wasn't clear uh, from the previous episode, when you have signals that have the same quote unquote name, and by the name, I'm meaning whenever I say the fish signal, the fish icon. Uh, for example, we have 100 fish coming out of this box and 100 fish coming out of this box. They both have the fish symbol the both fish the fish name uh, so they get combined together on the network that's why we're reading 200 fish uh, the wood signal has a different name it's it's got the name of the wood signal <laughs> or the the wood symbol uh, so it is treated as a separate signal on the same network which is why we get the 200 and the 100 and uh, down here when we look at the second network we are seeing the exact same reading we have 200 fish 100 wood uh, 200 fish down here and our 100 wood right there. The difference becomes apparent when we take a look at this other power pole. Uh, so if we look at this power pole, we're getting a reading of 200 fish and 100 wood, just like this one. Okay. And down here at this power pole, 100 fish and 100 wood. So uh, these two are being evaluated and combined together and being sent through this combinator where it combines with this side of the network where this second fish signal is coming in and being read to give us our total of 200. However, this 100 fish signal is not going backwards through the combinator. They act as kind of a one-way valve. Uh, so we can send these signals through to this network without changing their values and at the same time prevent this one from backflowing. Uh, particularly useful in some cases to isolate signals out. Uh, one thing you may do is if this is a local signal, you could do some local operations or local conditions based off of the values that you have here and then pass it into a more global network that has a bigger total of things where you could keep track of all the fish that you have, maybe with like a progress bar or something like that. Uh, a number of applications where this sort of isolation is useful.
Another property that combinators have that is good to know is how they deal with networks that come in on a different color line. So as we learned early on, uh, if I have a red chest here hooked up to the red network that has 50 fish and one hooked up to the green network that has 100 fish, as I go along these power poles, these networks are going to stay separate because they're different colors. See, we have 50 fish on the red network and 100 fish on the green network. However, uh, combinators have a tendency, they only take in one input, so they actually combine both networks together. So we still have 50 on the red and 100 on the green, but when we come through this combinator, we can see its input signal is 150, so it's taking 100, uh, 100 from here and 50 from here and combining them together, and then it's outputting 150. We're still doing the each signal plus zero output each, so this line is giving us 150 on both. Where this one kept them separate, this one combines it together. So another useful uh, to, way to, to, to use this, this particular arithmetic setup is to combine two separate colored networks, like we did here. Another useful application of the each plus zero output each is to use it as a signal converter. So if we look up here, I have a box that has 200 fish in it. Uh, down here, I have a box that has 100 fish in it. And I'm sending those uh, in the green network. I'm sending it to this combinator, which is taking the signal. And instead of just outputting each, we're actually converting that to a signal A. Uh, down here, we're taking this box and converting it to a signal B, and then we're running them both into this combinator and outputting that as a signal C. So at the end of the day, what that gives us on our power pole here is that A is the contents of the top chest, B is the contents of the bottom chest, and C is the total of these two chests combined. It's a, it's a way to, to basically just convert the signal and add them together. Very useful in some applications. All right, let's move on to the next combinator operation. This one actually does have some mathematical utility, but it's still pretty simple and straightforward. Let's take a look at what we have. We're taking each signal coming in. We're going to multiply it by a negative one, and then we're going to output each signal. We're going to take each signal coming in, and basically make it a negative number. That's really all we're doing here. Uh, so let's take a look at our setup here. We have a constant combinator up here that is sending out a value of 150 raw fish out onto this green network. Uh, then we have a box down here that has 25 fish inside of it. And that is what is being sent into the back of this combinator. So a signal of 25 fish is being sent into the back of this combinator. If we look over on the right, we can see that we're inputting in 25 and we're outputting negative 25. And then that's combining with this fish signal that's coming off this. So really what we're doing is we're taking this number and subtracting it from this number. So our grand total on the network should be 125 and it is. Uh, 150 minus 25. Now, I will do this a lot uh, for setting up uh, chests or something like that that I want to keep full to a specific number, uh, like loading stations, uh, things like that. I'll set down a constant combinator where I set the items that I want. I want 150 fish to be in that chest. And then I will have a setup like this that's running through a combinator that's turning the number negative that tells me how many I have. I have 25. I want 150. So the network value that comes out at the end of the day is telling me how many I need. So let's take a look at how that might be, uh, how, that, how we might use that. Uh, let's put an inserter here. And let's put a box here just, just for now. And let's take this inserter and hook it up to this green network so that it's reading the value, this value of items that we need off of the network. And then we could say, you know, if the fish signal coming in is greater than zero, because if we have 150 fish in this box, uh, 150 plus a, a negative 150 is going to be zero. That fish signal is no longer going to be greater than zero, so this guy will shut off. So let's go ahead and fill some fish in the box here. And let's see if it works. 
If we look over here at our value, we can see that number is going down as fish are added to the box. I should have went with a smaller number, huh? <laughs> All right, five, two, and uh, we're negative one. We're actually one over, but that value is greater or is less than zero. So our inserters shut off and we have 151 fish in our box. And we can control this now. Uh, we can control this inserter and how many items are in this box now just by messing with this constant combinator. We can say, okay, I want 160 now. And he'll grab 10 more and put those in the box. Uh, we got a value zero, so we should have exactly 160 in the box. Excellent. Or I can say I want, uh, you know, 500. And that guy can go to town and start working on that. And he'll run till we either run out of fish or until that box is filled up. Expanding on that idea a little bit, let's take a look at this setup. It's very similar to the previous setup uh, with just a couple little tweaks. Up here, we have our constant combinator where we're setting our request. It's currently turned off, which is why the system's not working. Uh, but notice that we're actually requesting multiple items here. We're requesting 100 fish, 100 stone, and 100 wood. Uh, we have our chest down here, which is where we want those items to go. Uh, currently, it is empty. But as we get items added to this chest, uh, their contents will be sent out as a signal into the back of this combinator, where they'll be multiplied by a negative one, making them a negative number, where well, they'll be combined with the signal from the combinator uh, and, and basically subtracted from that signal. So what we want, uh, what we have, and what we need. Now, instead of taking that signal and sending it to a fast inserter that was with an enable disable uh, condition, I'm sending it to a stack filter inserter because I have a lot of different items. I threw some copper plates and iron plates. These are things that I don't want. I only, only want these items. So I'm sending it to a stack filter inserter, and I have this stack filter inserter set to set its filters based off of the circuit network signals. So what that means is of all the signals coming in, it's going to take a look at them. And if any of them are greater than zero, it will set its filter to one of those items. So it's pretty much the same as the, uh, if the signal's greater than zero, enable it that we had in the previous setup. Uh, we're just implementing it a different way using the filters on the stack inserter that's going to do the exact same evaluation. However, there is a, a slight difference, a couple of slight differences. One, it should ignore the iron plates and copper plates where the uh, fast inserter necessar wouldn't necessarily do that. Uh, and also another distinction, which we'll look at a little bit later. So let's go ahead and turn it on. Um, he's going to go and grab the stone out, and he's got all that. Now he's moving on to the wood. He's grabbing the wood. And next he's going to grab the fish. And he's got the fish and all the copper plates and all this other leftover stuff is done. Great. All right, let's, uh, let's set up a, a situation here, and... Uh, Let's see what happens. Uh, let's see, we've already got plenty of items in there. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put less wood than we actually need in here. And then let's see what happens when we turn this guy on. Uh, he's gonna grab the stone brick. Gonna move on to the wood. Still on the wood. Still on the wood. Still on the wood. Even though we have plenty of fish in here, he's going to stay on the wood because of the kind of hidden sort order that's in Factorio. At least that's the best I've been able to tell. And uh, this sort order is based off of the item ID. And this guy, this filter inserter, is going to select the signal coming in that's greater than zero that has the lowest item ID. And you can get an idea of the item idea ID by looking at your inventory because the items in here sort by the item ID. So you'll notice it grabbed stone bricks first. They show up in my inventory first. Then it went for wood, which shows up next. And then we have fish, which shows up after that. And if you go into the F4 menu and select the show debug info in tooltips option, and uh, let's go ahead and open up our inventory. You can actually see that item ID if you hover over something. It's at the very bottom. The wood is item ID 108, and the fish is 114. Since the lower item ID 
is in the wood, it's going to sit there and wait for that to occur. It only happens if, if this guy can't fulfill his request. But um, there's a number of situations whenever whenever you're forcing a factorio entity to select a signal for you, uh, it's going to go to the one with the lowest item ID, and it may not always be the one you want. Luckily, this little quirk is something that can easily be worked around with the third combinator operation that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. The decider combinator with each coming in greater than zero output one of each. This is basically saying, hey, if you're getting a signal, go ahead and output one of it. It turns it into a Boolean operation, a yes, no operation. Are you getting a signal? One yes, zero no. And if we take a look at our setup here, it's very, very similar to what we had before, with the exception we've added three combinators and redone the wiring just a little bit. We still have our constant combinator up here. It's still currently turned off, and we have our signals of the three items that we want and how, many, how much we want in that chest. Uh, down here, we still have our chest. It's currently empty. This is where we want our items to go. It's going into the back of the combinator that is making it negative and coming up here and combining with that to give us what we need on the green network. Now, this what we need, this green network value, is going into the back of this decider combinator that's saying for each signal coming in greater than zero, go ahead and output one of it. So this one is basically asking and answering a question. Do we need it? Yes or no. If we get a one coming out, we need it. If there's nothing coming out, we don't. Now, this combinator over here is set up the same way, each greater than zero, output one of each. But it is looking down here at this chest, which we never had up wired before. This one is the items that are available. This can be hooked up to, you know, the, the box that you're pulling from, or if you're pulling from a train, which I typically am in a situation like this, uh, we can read the train contents and make sure that the train actually has the item. Uh, these are the available things for this inserter to grab from. I have that hooked up to this uh, red network here that's going up to this power pole and into the back of this combinator and is asking the question, is it available? Is it something that we can get? And we'll send out a one for yes and a zero for no. It'll send out nothing for no. Uh, now these two questions that we're asking, is it something that we need? Is it something that's available? Are wired together on this red wire and then go into the back of this combinator that is set for each signal coming in. If it equals two, go ahead and output one of each. So when is this signal going to be two? It's going to be two only when this combinator and this combinator both answer yes to the same question. So if I need it, and it's something that is available, that value is going to be two and it's going to be sent into this combinator. And then that value is what is being set to our filter inserter. So if it's something that we don't need anymore, if we've got enough of the item, this one will evaluate to false and this guy is not going to fire. So this guy will never set his filter to it. If it's something we're out of, like we were out of wood the last time in the chest, and that's what caused everything to stall, if we're out of the item, this one won't fire. This one will be the only one firing, and we, we're not going to have our two conditions, so it's not going to work. The only time it's going to work is when both conditions are true. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn it on. Uh, let's see, what do we have available in here? We have a shortage of wood. We've only got 50 wood in there. We have plenty of fish. We have plenty of stone. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn it on, and we'll watch our pole here. Okay, we're almost done with the stone. We've now moved to wood. And even though we're still not satisfied with our wood signal, he went ahead and completely emptied out all the fish. So he grabbed everything that was possibly available. Another property that both arithmetic and decider combinators have that's good to know about is a delay. In this setup, I have a constant combinator that is outputting 100 fish, or at least will be whenever I turn it on, and it's hooked up to a red and a green network. The red network goes directly to this light, which is set to turn on if any signal comes in is greater than zero. And the green signal goes through a whole bunch of combinators here that are set to each plus zero output each. And they eventually end up at this light 
that has the exact same condition. So let's look at what happens when we turn on these networks. Now pay very close attention to these two lights. Let me try to situate myself a little better. Okay, let's turn it on. Ah, did you see that? All right, now watch the lights again and let's turn it off. Now, what you noticed is that when we turned it on, that this light came on almost immediately, while this light had a little bit of a delay. And again, when we turned it off, this light turned off immediately, while this one went out after a little bit of a delay. So let's go ahead and do it again. Turn it on. Turn it off. Turn it on. Turn it off and let's leave it on to kind of explain what's happening here so when a signal is going across a wire it happens instantaneously uh, on the same tick it happens immediately so when this fish signal gets turned on it gets to this light there, there's no time to travel between these two and it doesn't matter how many wires you have we could stretch out this red wire all the way across the basin back uh, for miles and miles it doesn't matter it's going to travel to this light instantaneously Whenever a signal passes through a combinator, however, it actually takes one tick for it to move from the input side to the output side. And the reason why I chain so many of these together is just to kind of make that delay exaggerated. So we're going through, uh, let's see, how many, how many combinators do we have here? Uh, 33 ticks, or almost half of a second delay that is going through. Uh, there's there should be if you're running at 60 updates per second uh that those individual updates that is a game tick so there's 60 ticks in a second or at least should be um so and if if i run through this again i want you to look at the little blue lights that go across the combinators here you can see them line up you'll you'll see a little light go brrrp and brrrp as we turn it off let me just do that again here i don't know if you can quite catch that but you can see these little kind of blue lights just going uh, up and down through the chain as as you can see the delay as it's passing through. Now, this delay, uh, most of the time and most of the operations you're going to experience, it's not going to cause you a lot of problems. However, it does have a lot of very useful uses. So let's revisit a previous example that we did just to kind of see an area where this delay concept might be a little bit useful. Uh, going back to the alarm with a programmable speaker, I have a couple of them here. Uh, one is set whenever there's no wood to play a vibraphone C note. And this one down here, let's go ahead and hook it up, is set to play whenever there is wood to play the F. So if there's wood in there, this one will play. And if we take the wood out, this one will play. Put the wood back in, this one plays, etc., etc. Now this works exactly the way it should, but uh, tell you the honest truth, I'm getting a little bit of a headache, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. It's just going to ding, 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 ding all the time. Now, uh, let's take a look down here at this one uh, with the combinator in the mix. Uh, let's just start off here. If I put wood in the chest, I get the C. If I take it out, I get the C. Sorry, the F and then the C. So F and then the C. And it only plays once. Now let's take a look at why this is occurring. We can see we have a green network here uh, that's hooked up into these programmable speakers. This one, the one that's playing the C, or the empty one, is saying if wood is less than zero... That's different than what we had above, but it's it's needed. Uh, this one down here, if wood is greater than zero, uh, play the F. Uh, so again, play the F, play the C. So whenever we put a piece of wood in this particular box, we can see it's going out on the green network. So whenever I put 100 wood in that box, 100 wood is going out into this network. And then we have it also going into the back of this combinator, which is taking that signal, multiplying it by a negative one, and outputting each signal. So we're actually subtracting that from this green network. So if we put it in here and we read off of the green network, we're not getting a signal. We have 100 wood coming out onto the green network, 
And we have 100 wood going into the back of this one, which is evaluating to negative 100, and they're canceling each other out. So we're not getting anything out here, which is what's expected. But there's that one millisecond delay it takes for that signal to get through this combinator and to get out on this green network. So that means when we add wood to this chest, there is one tick where that negative number hasn't been added in yet and exists on this green network, which is just enough time for this guy to pick it up. The next tick, this value has gone through and canceled it out. And the same thing happens in reverse when we pull the wood out, the green network gets pulled out immediately, but there's a one tick delay here where a negative 100 wood signal is going out here. And that's when this guy is going to pick up that and go off. So what we've done here is actually done two things which are fairly useful in circuit designs in games like Factorio and Minecraft and other things that have these sort of things. We've created essentially a pulse generator, which will take a steady signal and convert it just simply to a pulse by canceling it out. We've done that. But we've also done a leading and trailing, so we can detect when it's going up, or edge detection. We can detect when it's going up, and we can also detect when it's going down. So two birds with one stone there. Very, very handy, and has a lot of uses. Mostly to make trains go ding-ding when they come into the station. That's what I use them for a lot. I like it. Another extremely useful application of this circuit delay can be demonstrated by this setup right here. We have two decider combinators up top, two arithmetic combinators at the bottom. The arithmetic combinators are set to each plus zero output each, and the decider combinator is set to each greater than zero output one. So our two simple circuits here. Uh, we're feeding that with a constant combinator that is currently not turned on, but it's just going to send out one fish signal. So let's go ahead and turn it on and see what we get. Uh, the decider combinators, as we look at our power pole here, we have a fish signal of 1, which is expected. Uh, we have a fish signal of 1, which is also expected. Uh, this arithmetic combinator here has a fish signal of 1. Uh, since it's just carrying the signal through, that is expected. This one down here, though, is going crazy. It's reading 1K, 1.1K, 1.2K. It's just kind of going, going crazy. Uh, so let's turn this off. And uh, take a look at our poles again. Up here, this one is not getting a signal, which is expected. Uh, this one is showing a value of 1. Weird. Um, this arithmetic combinator is uh, not giving us a signal, also expected. This one down here is now up to 1.6k, but it has at least finally stopped incrementing. So the reason, it's a very, very subtle difference, but these combinators are set up all the same with the exception of this decider and this arithmetic combinator. You can see that the output is actually wired to the input. There's actually a green wire going from this post to this post. And we are actually utilizing the circuit delay to create a memory cell. So in the case of this guy right here, this decider, we sent it a one and it's actually remembering that value that we sent it, that, that one signal. The reason why is because of the circuit delay. It's, uh, it looks like it's just a steady one here, but what's really happening, since the output is wired to the input, every tick, <laughs> it's just going around in a circle. It's coming out the output, going in the input, going in the output, going in the input, and it just keeps going around and around and around and around and around in a circle. Uh, the arithmetic combinator is acting a little bit differently, though the exact same concept applies. Uh, we give it a value of 1. That value of 1 is then output and put back, so we have a value of 1 going into it from the combinator, but then we're still getting a value of 1 here. So at the next tick, that's 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5, and 6, and it just keeps going every single tick, and that's why we saw that increment. Even when everything is turned off, uh, once we're not supplying the external input anymore, it's just taking that 1.6k and then just circling it back around really, 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 really fast. Output to input, output to input. And uh, this is uh, basically how you make a memory cell inside Factorio, just by wiring the input to the output and just letting that value circle back and forth. All right, so I have a memory cell in Factorio. What do I do with it? Well, here's one practical application.
Uh, if you take a look at these two combinators right here, they're set up exactly the same way as they were in the previous setup. With one exception, the decider combinator is sending out the input count instead of the one. Uh, but the inputs are wired to the outputs, and we're actually feeding it from a pair of inserters that are set to read their hand contents and send that out as a pulse. So once they grab one of these items, one of these fish, it's going to pulse into the back of these combinators. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn it on and see what we get. And as we look at our power pole here, we get a nice little count of the amount of fish that these inserters have pulled off the line. The arithmetic combinator, as well as the decider combinator, uh, give us the exact same result with the logic going in. Um, you can use either for a counter. They're both they're both they're both valid to, to use a, as that. I'll, I'll typically go with the arithmetic combinator just because that's what I started using. Although there are a number of valid arguments for using a decider combinator. Most of those will be in the comments below, as uh, they tend to be every time I bring up uh, counting with an arithmetic combinator. But yeah, this will just keep counting and counting indefinitely until we tell it to stop. One way we can make it stop, or at least keep it somewhat under control, is with a setup like this. Uh, very similar to what was in the previous setup. However, there's just a, a one little addition down here, or a couple little additions down here. We have an inserter here that's grabbing fish off of the line. Uh, it's reading its hand contents and pulsing that signal out into a combinator that is set to the each times negative one output each. So each time this guy grabs a fish, we're going to go through here and get a negative fish and then send that value into our memory cell. And that is going to subtract from the total that this is, uh, this is remembering. So this inserter is doing our adding as we're adding fish onto the line. This inserter is then doing subtracting as it pulls fish off the line. And if we look at our circuit value here, we'll see it go between five and six. But this is actually measuring the amount of fish that are between these two belt segments. Uh, decider combinator setup doing the exact same way with the exact same setup with the inserter at the bottom. Um, if you've ever seen me do a sushi setup or sushi science setup, this is the basis for the way that that works. We have one inserter grabbing science packs and sending that value into a, counting, a counter over which uh, science pack it grabbed. And then our inserter that's feeding into the science lab is subtracting that from that total. And that's pretty much my, the way my sushi setup works. It's, it's actually a really simple idea. It just looks a lot more complex than it actually is. Another useful application of memory cells is to fix a problem that you may not even realize that you have. Uh, you'll encounter this sometimes with accumulators. Uh, you'll encounter it sometimes with fluid systems. And you'll encounter it whenever you find yourself with a setup similar to what I have here with these two inserters. Uh, we have a fast inserter here that's hooked up to the circuit network. It's set to enable disable itself when the fish signal is less than 20. And we're pointing that to this chest here. So whenever there's less than 20 fish in here, uh, we're going to go ahead and enable this inserter and grab another fish. On the other side, we have a regular inserter. It's just pulling fish out of the chest and putting them on this belt. It's not hooked up to the circuit network. It's just a dumb inserter doing its inserting duties. Uh, what you'll notice if we open up this chest is that this fish goes between 19 and 20. And that's it. As soon as this guy grabs a fish, this guy is going to put one in. And it's going to spend most of its time disabled, but as soon as this guy grabs one, it's going to fill up another one. Uh, in this particular setup, you know, kind of big deal, but if we expand this out uh, and start thinking about other things where we have a chest and the set threshold, we can kind of run into some problems. If you think about instead of filling this up with just an inserter, what if we were filling it up with a train? If I have a train that's going to come and fill up this chest to 20, weird I know, but just, just bear with me here, uh, and then an inserter just grabs one item out of it, I don't want another train to come. I would rather have some sort of tolerance built in so that this chest could empty out to like a low watermark or a low threshold. Then we call in the train to fill it up to a higher watermark, and then we have a little bit of tolerance in there where this guy could just grab without actually having to activate another object. 
Probably a better way to explain the problem is to show the solution, and then we'll contrast it with the problem so you can hopefully see what I'm talking about here. Uh, we have a chest set up in a very similar manner, and once it gets below 20, this inserter is going to kick on and then fill it up to a amount a lot more than 20. It's actually going to go up to 50, and then it's going to turn itself off and just sit there and wait until this chest is below 20 again. We're at 30 right now. Uh, 27, 24, 21, and bam, he's going to turn it on and then fill it back up to 50. So we've put that tolerance in there so this inserter just isn't working all the time, or our train isn't working all the time, or our pump isn't working all the time. We have a little bit of a threshold here. And this is accomplished using an SR latch, or I guess more accurately, an RS latch, as I have read. Uh, so well, let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, what we do is we have the S and the R, as best as I can be able to tell, uh, stand for set and reset. We, we have a circuit that we want to have a set value and then have a reset value. The set value is what I refer to as a low watermark or how low I want this chest to get before I enable the circuit and make this inserter go. And if we take a look at this, I'm saying if the fish signal is less than 20, I want you to send out that set signal or that S signal. And then down here, we have one that is the reset signal, or what I refer to as the high watermark. This is how many items I want this inserter to fill this chest up with uh, before it disables itself. And we currently have that set to 50. So whenever this chest gets below 20, send out the set and keep that set enabled until we are greater than 50 in that chest, then I want you to send out that reset signal. And we send those values into a decider memory cell right here. And I'm just saying if the set signal is greater than R, send out the set signal. It's going to remember the last set signal that was set, and when we get the R signal coming in, this condition is no longer going to be true, so it's not going to send out the S anymore. That's going out on the red network, and that is the enable disable condition here. It's just when you get that set signal, whenever we're beneath that, go ahead and enable yourself, and then due to this memory cell, it's going to remember that S value, and it's just going to keep it in there until that reset symbol is set and then that's going to clear out the memory cell and turn it off so let's take that latch idea and expand on it a little bit we have a more complex circuit here uh, there's a few more combinators and a lot more wires but I assure you, uh, the same logic we used for this SR latch right here uh, is being applied in here. It, it works the exact same way. There's just a couple of additional features and things that are being done here. Um, if we look over here to the left, we have a constant combinator where we can set the amount of items, the base amount of items, that we want in this chest and notice that we're not requesting one item we're actually requesting multiples and uh, we can set as many different items here as we want uh, but 20 fish and 10 wood uh, this signal is traveling along this red wire into the back of these two combinators and these two combinators right here are calculating our low watermarks and high watermarks. Now a couple of notes, uh, since this system supports more than one items, uh, we're going to run into a couple of limitations with a setup like this. We have a constant signal going out to enable the inserter, this S signal. Well if I have two items that single S signal is not going to work because S coming out, we're out of something, but is it fish or is it wood? I, I, I don't know. Uh, so we had, to, we had to do something to address that. And also with the high and low watermarks, I had those set with constant values in these combinators. Well, since we could be requesting different amounts of different items, we can no longer set those as well. So those need to be uh, dynamically calculated. And we're doing that in these two combinators right here. I'm taking the value and multiplying it by a negative two. I'm taking the value and multiplying it by two. I'm putting a negative on it just to save a combinator down the line whenever we do a subtraction operation. So the amount of items here times two is our low watermark. 
And the amount of items here times four is going to be our high water mark. And again, negative to save a combinator down the line. Um, the reason why it's set up this way is originally what I wanted was to be able to go into this combinator right here. A lot of the items in Factorio are set on a per minute, per second, uh, per time interval basis. So I need X number of items per minute. Uh, in order to make this uh, device at this uh, particular setup that we have. So that's kind of the idea that, that I wanted to go with with here. I would set the items per minute that I wanted in this particular combinator, and then I could calculate the high and low water marks based off of increments of that interval. So basically what I'm saying here is that uh, once this chest gets lower than two minutes, uh, worth of items in it. I want you to activate and I want you to fill up that chest until you have four Minutes worth of items inside of it So let's look at the low water mark first and let's concentrate on the wood signal since it's the one that seems to be getting the most action right now um, Our signals coming from our combinator going into our low water mark and that is calculating out to negative 20. We're getting 10 wood coming in. We're multiplying that by negative 2 and getting negative 20. Uh, the output of that combinator is going into the back of this decider combinator, but it's also being combined with the green network that is coming in. If we trace this wire back, we can see that this wire is connected to our chest where our items currently reside. So those two are being added together right here. Whatever's in this chest is being added to the negative 20. And we're trying to see whenever each signal is less than zero. And if it is, we're going to send that on. So when is that signal going to be less than zero? That signal is going to be less than zero whenever the items in this chest are less than our low watermark. That will evaluate to a negative number since we're subtracting 20 from it. So if we subtract 20 from anything less than 20, that's going to be less than the items that we need. And that is going to fire this and send each output on into this, which is a decider combinator set to each condition greater than one output each. But the input is wired to the output, so that is our memory cell. That's the, the thing that we had right here. It's basically this guy right here. Now, we don't have the SNR signals. We can't because we have multiple different items. So instead of the constant S and R, we're actually tracking the, the signal, the wood signal, basically. Send out a wood signal whenever you're less than, whenever we're below our low watermark, send out a wood signal. And this guy, since that's greater than zero, it's going to stay in there and keep going around and around and around because it's a memory cell, and it's basically going to remember that value. Now, our high water mark is going to be our reset signal. Let's look at the way that that works. Uh, again, we're calculating our high water mark. We're sending that into the back of this combinator. Again, we're passing in the contents of this chest as well and combining those together. And now we're looking if each is greater than zero. If it is, go ahead and send that out. Well, when is that condition true? That condition is going to be true whenever the items in this chest are more than what we have for our high water mark. So whenever that, if, if we have uh, 50 items in there, um, 50 minus 40 is going to be 10. That's going to be greater than zero. And that's going to go on. If we have 30, uh, 30 minus uh, 30 minus 40 is going to be a negative 10, which is going to be less than zero. So that guy's not going to fire. So it's only going to come in whenever we have enough items. Um, that's going to pass into the back of this combinator, which is going to take that value and make it into a negative one. So this guy's going to send out a one of the signal. This guy is going to make it negative, And then that's going to go into the back of this combinator, canceling out the one that was put there by the set signal. So our reset signal is just a negative version of the single signal that we put into the memory cell. The low water mark, when it fires, it puts it in the memory cell. The high water mark takes it out, subtracts it out. And then you can see the red wire off of our memory cell here goes down and is going into this inserter where it is setting its filter whenever that set signal is received for one of the items. 
And that brings us to this circuit setup right here, which if you recall, this is actually the station that we used in the On Rails series. A lot of combinators, a lot of wires, a lot of complexity, but I assure you that over the last two episodes, we've actually covered every single part of this station. It's just all of that crammed in together. So in the next episode, we'll, we'll take this station apart a little bit and see how it works, get a review of how this station works, as well as... Uh, Look at some of the new features that are available to us in the current version of Factorio and see if those can't easily be incorporated in. Woo! That was a long one, huh? A lot of information in that video. But I like the way that it ended up, though. I thought it really brought it all together, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next one. I think it's going to be a good one. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Kitsch, didn't you wear that shirt in the last video? Do you own any more clothing? Well... Let me respond to that by saying that two things can be true at the same time. I, I actually do own more clothing, but I'm most likely shooting this on the same day that I shot the last video outro. As a matter of fact, there's a really good chance that I'm shooting that outro after I do this one because I have a tendency to shoot things over and over and over again as they get to the editing floor. There's also a very good chance that you're never actually going to see this because I'm going to cut it and re-record it afterwards and I may be wearing a different shirt. Clear? Clear. All right, y'all have a good one.